can a marriage survive without trust? And, you know, a lot of the times, Pastor David and Marie, is I work with couples and I see this element of trust not there. And as I dig deeper, I, I find that their trust in the Lord really is something they still have to find. And so mm -hmm. uh, something interesting that I would hear quite often from our interviews, Pastor, you said it quite a few times, Marie, you've said it uh, from Proverbs 31, 11, where it says the heart of her husband safely trust her. And I've heard you both mention that in the different context. And it really speaks to how uh, how you often, often say also, her heart is in my hands. Her heart is in, excuse me, my heart is in her hands. And you've also said that to one another. Uh, and so marriages, many marriages don't have trust because they don't fully trust in the Lord. Can you both share the importance of how trust is in the marriage? And one of the things I think that is the hardest thing to regain when it's lost is trust. Absolutely. Because when people, when when you make your vows to God and one another, you're 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 promising that you're going to keep your word, that you're going to do the things that they're requesting you to to promise that you will. You know, the love to cherish, to be concerned for, provide for, and all of that. And so, when a person is in, is trusting of the other person, it simply means that their their hearts are safe uh, with them. You know, they have they have fully committed themselves to to um, giving themselves over to believing that that person is good to the word and they're going to keep their promises. And so when trust is broken in a marriage, John, and you know this because you do marital counseling, it's one of the hardest things to regain because broken trust uh, also very often speaks of a broken heart. Mm. And so uh, it, it's, it's an area that you need to safeguard. And trust, I believe, when, uh, when, when I exercise trust in Marie or she has trust in me, it rests on my commitment to the Lord and the integrity of my heart. You know, she, in other words, knows that I'm a person who's going to keep my word, mm -hmm. that I'm going to do what I said, and that secures her, that gives her security. And so for me, in a relationship, in my relationship with my wife, trust has been uh, one of the most important things to have but it also can be one of the most fragile things that you have because it easily breaks. It's easily broken. And so to safeguard myself in, in the uh, love of my wife required me to take a huge step of faith to believe that she would be true to what she was saying to me, that she actually meant what she was saying and that she would hold fast to what she was saying. And so over time, I grew to trust her more and more. I initially trusted her because why would I marry someone I didn't trust? Mm -hmm. But trust had to be built up and retained over the course of, of the years that we've been together. And so f as I understand love and as I understand um, relationships, you know, uh, love believes all things and hopes all things and endures all things. And all of this is really a reflection of the fact that love is trusting, you know, believing and hoping and enduring because we trust one another. And so in the Proverbs um, chapter 31, portion of scripture you were mentioning, where the husband heart does safely trust in her, while he gave all the qualities of that woman prior to making that statement, her faithfulness and her diligence and her spirituality, there's so many components to her, that this is a woman he could trust. And so Marie is a woman that I can trust because she, she is that kind of woman, you know, a diligent woman, a loving woman, a woman that, that makes me, uh, actually advances me in the sight of others because a, a good wife, as the Proverbs woman was, a good, wife, a good wife makes a husband look good, you know? And so in the fact that Marie is my, my champion in many ways, meaning that she, she will champion me, she'll talk about her husband and how much she loves me, uh, to others on occasion, you know, she doesn't do it all the time. She, she shouldn't, doesn't have to. But when she does, I always come out looking good. And that makes me feel that I can safely trust in her because she obviously has my best interest in her heart and I obviously have impacted her to the point where she can trust in me also. 
So, yeah, I, I would say that the man stood before God and witnesses, and he said to the woman he was holding hands with, I, I will love you and I will trust you all of my days. But in doing so, that was a great step of faith. And uh, if she should decide to, to break that trust in a variety of ways, it's not always a physical thing. If she takes the paycheck and spends it on herself and never lets him know how she's spending their money, or if she uh, develops relationships with friends that, that override her, her relationship to him to the mm -hmm. point where he comes home and she's on the phone and she doesn't get off and he begins to wonder who she's talking about and whether she's talking poorly about him. You know, in, in uh, marital relations where, where she may complain to her, her mom about the husband and he hears better, all those kinds of things can, can, can break the trust that he had uh, in her. But when she proves herself to be faithful, uh, to openly communicate anything that she has in her heart that concerns her so that the two uh, actually work out their own problems without mm -hmm. having to always bring some other party in, right. uh, some friend of hers that she likes to talk to or a relative that she likes to talk to or vice versa. He talks to his friends or he's telling other people and complaining, breaking her trust in him. No, the way trust, I think, works best for us is we trust each other. And so we have a concern. It's not to somebody else that I initially would speak to and probably very seldom would ever at all because I've learned with Marie, I can work these things out together. We can work these things out if we put God first and his word first and, and agree to put into practice what we see God's word to be saying. This is how Marie and I have, uh, have been all these years, John. It's not that I don't think a person should go to somebody else and, and ask for advice. I think sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes it's even wise to do that, mm -hmm. but not always. And in, in the case of Marie and me, I, I would say over the years that we've been together, we've worked our things out together, not because we're so private that we don't want people to know we aren't perfect, but because we work hard at having a relationship, which includes sometimes speaking of the things that are difficult to speak of, to be open and honest. And, and, uh, we pretty much we pretty much are that way. I, Marie can tell you that about me. I, if I got something on my heart, she's gonna know. That's true. You know, I'm not <laughs> gonna hold very back. True. You know, yeah, I'm not gonna hold back. It's us. I'm safeguarding us. I'm right. not gonna have have a wedge that comes between Marie and me because I won't tell her I'm dissatisfied with something or concerned about something or hurt about something. And we work it out together. And 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 where humility is, you know, where Marie. And using myself as an example, speaking to Marie, my heart, where Marie's humility comes into play is that she's able to hear it. She knows the words that I'm speaking to her. They may not be the ones she wants to hear at that moment, but they're coming from a hurt person whom she loves and, and whom I trust. I trust her. She'll listen to me. Mm -hmm. And that's how we work out any of our differences or any, any um, disagreements we might have. Uh, normally, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, um, we're able to handle things pretty much in that one conversation, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the trust that we have for each other. Because, you know, the thing I like to say, I say it often, and especially when I'm teaching, is um, we chose us, you that's know, right. we chose us. You know, out of all the choices we've made in terms of relationships and friendships and even family, we chose us, you know, the two became one, and that's our most important so relationship. Yeah. Do you, uh, with the trust that you guys have with one another, is there a point in your marriage that you hit a certain point in your trust and it's on cruise control for the rest of your relationship? Or is it trust that has to be worked on on a daily basis? Or maybe there's a different degrees of trust that you that you guys work on, is there a certain time in your in your marriage that you, you say, okay, we trust each other, so therefore we really don't have to work on trust because we trust each other? Or is it something that it's always there? Uh, it's a combination of the two, I'd yeah. say. You know, it's always there. That. That's our foundation. That's our foundation. But um, in our in our case again, John, we we've been we've been together a long time and there's never been a reason given to me by her that I shouldn't trust her. 
So much of my marital love for Marie is on that strong foundation that I fully trust her. Now, did I trust her when I first married her? Not like I do now, so trust grows over time. But um, it took a while for me to actually, actually completely trust her, that she loved me. But that's only because I had a, a background that, that didn't define love very well. It was defined poorly in many ways, and and so I didn't know, I didn't know what love really, I didn't know what love really was. I I had my biblical understanding. I could give you a Bible study on how love is, First Corinthians thirteen and John fifteen and John thirteen. I could give you scriptures, Ephesians four. I could give you scriptures related to love and what love looks like and what love does and what love means. I could do all of that. But in terms of really knowing it on a personal level and really trusting Marie that she was very sincere, uh, it took time because I had to grow in my walk with God to the point where, mm -hmm. where, where I, I even felt he loved me, you know, because cause for a long time uh, I believed he loved other people. God so loved the world, but I didn't believe he loved me as much as he loved other people. I really didn't. And so I was able to preach about the love of God for others, but I didn't receive it very deeply for me. And so because I wasn't able to, I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know much about it on a personal level other than once in a while the Spirit gives you a little bit of a glimpse into his love, maybe through an, an Easter service or an awakening that takes place on Christmas some special time where God's love is really demonstrated. I might walk away in my earlier days and say, boy, God loves us. But I did not know how to receive the love. She could tell you this, you know, that there were times when I would tell her, even into the marriage for a while, where I would say, when are you going to stop loving me? When are you going to stop? Because I thought you would. Mm -hmm. And it took a long time for me to finally say, you know, there's an old song, this time the girl has come to stay for more than just a day. Mm -hmm. uh, it took a long time for me to realize that. And now, after all of these years, you know, she's too old to run away, John. <laughs> <laughs> no. She um, runs, she runs slow. I trusted him from the very beginning. <laughs> and I still do. And that's interesting uh, to see where... <laughs> you better watch it. <laughs> It's interesting you say that, Marie, because you see Pastor came from a different uh, perspective in mm -hmm. terms of trust, mm -hmm. where you're saying that when you first trusted Pastor right off from the get-go. I did. I did. Well, he was my mentor because he was, I sat under him uh, in Bible study. So sitting through that time, I, I trusted him. That's like a reinforcement of trust because you do see him as a mentor. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. were saved under his ministry. Right. Uh, and Absolutely. so all these things, that the trust that comes within that. Yeah, that, that's interesting. That's and, interesting. And to through me. the whole marriage, I, I trusted. I trusted him. Maybe not some women, but him. <laughs> <laughs> not with me and the women, John. I, I'm teasing. It I'm was so, I'm women so... who were interested in me. <laughs> We'll put it that way. I don't want anybody watching to think. Oh, no, I, of course not. I know. I, know. I wouldn't know be sitting here today. <laughs> Trust me. Yeah, I'd or, be off or maybe there with Bambi. You, and, and yes, I, I was going to say, he wouldn't be sitting here today either. <laughs> no. I, I, I'd, be in, I'd be in Rose Hills in Forest Lawn. That's where I'm I'd sorry. be. Pushing up daisies right That's where I'd be. There's no doubt about that. Don't get a Mexican woman oh. mad, John. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, John. <laughs> oh. I'm tell your wife. <laughs> you know, how has trusting the Lord given you both the ability to trust one another? You mentioned a little bit about it, Pastor. Uh, when you be, and again, I, I run into couples that have their trust has been broken in previous relationships, and then they come into new relationships and they don't trust right off the bat. Sometimes I think that's not fair for the other person. 
But then when I think about it more, I think it's how is their trust in the Lord really affecting their ability to trust? Uh, what would you guys say about that? I really, I really believe that if you don't trust the Lord, you won't trust other people. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. You, you have to really be secure and be more aware of who you are in Christ. That was that. That's biblically and sol solid, yes. but that's also practically, experientially true, because it was it was a while until I came to realize what Scripture says when it says God so loved, like I said a moment ago, the world. I finally, I finally just inserted my own name amongst the other billions that are on the face of the earth, and who have lived, and and that's where it begins. It's I believe that a lot of times. People have difficulty trusting others because they don't know that uh, God really loves them. Mm -hmm. So my security in my relationship with Marie, yeah, I, you know, as I speak, I speak more openly, but it wasn't real observable. Marie, Marie would not have known I was struggling with issues like that. She mm -hmm. wouldn't have known that That's true. because I, I didn't wear that on my sleeve. It was my private torment. It was my private doubt that I had to deal with, but she never saw that. That's why she could she could trust me because because um, I didn't I didn't show her anything that would make her not want to trust me or not believe she could, and she could trust me. I I I wanted to be that man, but it was more on a personal thing. So when the Lord began to awaken me to the scriptures that relate to who I am in Christ and and uh, what He has done in my life and and. Um, you know, Ephesians 1, you know, my position in Christ and being sealed by his Holy Spirit and and being filled by his Holy Spirit. And and I began to take my eyes off myself and the feelings that I had and began to trust that God doesn't lie. And thus, when he says that he loves or he'll provide for you or he'll he'll be there for you, um, to believe that he that he would, not just for other people, but for me. And so much of our growth in our marriage actually has a lot to do with my growth as a pastor and as a teacher and as a Christian. Because this month in a couple of weeks, we're going to celebrate 39 years of, of this church's existence, 39 years of seeing God's faithfulness, mm -hmm. seeing God do works in our life, providing in ways, you know, um, reinforcing. Because Because I'll speak to him, you know, in this time of um, of, uh, of panic, in this time of of, of fear mongering that I think the press is very guilty of, you know, of, of the dissemination of misinformation, where you have to pick and choose what is true, what is not true, what is their opinion, and not being a scientist, doctor, or whatever. We, as a nation, we're just at, we're at the at the mercy of those who choose how they're going to manipulate that news to make us feel, well, that's, you know, here the church, people are saying to me, you know, this, our stability and, and our strength is what's helping many of them to, to weather the storm. And, and because that's true, where did my strength come from? You know, is, is it denial? Because there are those who think right. it is. Oh, you're just, you know, you're a science rejecter and, no, it, it isn't denial. It's just my, my pastor Chuck said, when I don't know something, I rely on the things that I do know. You know, and the psalmist said, truly God is good. The phrase is, truly God is good to Israel. But uh, Chuck said, you know, let's look at the few, first few words. Truly God is good. And if, if you believe God is good truly, then he'll see you through everything. Mm -hmm. And over time, what has happened with me is that, you know, I wonder how many people, and, and this is all practical as it pertains to my marriage, even though it's ministry as I'm speaking to you. But, you know, people have mortgages, John. People have um, rent for their apartment or a payment on a car or they have a house payment that they're paying. They've, they've got mortgages and payments. You know, I do too. But I also have a mortgage on this church and when you've got a hundred thousand square feet of building you know and 13 and a half acres of land and you've got 50 employees 
and there is a shutdown of church services. And the majority of our people don't use online giving techniques. And, and you hear that and, and you say, how are we going to survive? Because mortgage is still needing to be paid because employees are still doing work. How are we going to, how are we going to pay? And I put my head on my pillow on a Sunday night and I come to work on a Monday morning and the spirit of the Lord reminds me of how when our church was young and we had a real need and he said, I didn't raise you up to let you fall. And I arrive at this office here to an empty parking lot where there's no church services and half my employees are off because of the COVID scare. I came in with faith and I came in saying, my God shall supply all my need. But the average person doesn't do that. The average person doesn't pay a huge mortgage bill. You know, our, our payment here without going into detail is much more than the average person is going to pay in their lifetime for, for you know, for mortgage alone, not, not including everything else, upkeep and electricity and you name it, right? Why am I saying that to you? I'm saying that because God has proven to be faithful in every element. Mm -hmm. God is taking care of us and God does take care of us. And, and, and God knows by heart because, because I, I, I will tell him, Lord, is it because you don't want me serving you anymore? And as a pastor, should I step out? Is it time? And he supplies. And he says, no, son. No, I will supply your need. I'm putting you back where you were 39 years ago to trust me. Because maybe I forgot. Maybe I started taking for granted all his provision. And so those are the things that make me know my God is trustworthy. And, and he loves us and he loves his church. That's the stuff that goes into my heart that makes me trustworthy for my wife. My God is trustworthy for me. I should be trustworthy for others, right? It's a real simple principle. And so, you know, Marie, can, Marie can, I, I don't have to speak for her. She says it herself, but she has no reason to ever not trust me. I will never give her a reason, John. And that's not pride. That's not a boast. And let him who thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. Well, I'm aware of my own weaknesses and, and I am aware of the devices of Satan and how he works and how he'll undermine and he'll put something in your path at a certain weak moment to, to un, undermine. I know how he works in those ways in my life. It's not that I know every way, but I've been with the Lord almost 50 years. I've, I've learned some things. And the one thing that I do that Marie can tell you, and I speak for her because she doesn't mind me doing it, is I will never betray my wife. You know, there are things I will never do, and that's one of them, because my greatest love outside of Christ is my wife. She has been my greatest support, greatest friend, greatest encourager, truest love. She's all those things. Why would I break that trust? Why would I lose that love that I see in her eyes every time she looks at me? Why would I lose it? For what? For what? For pride? For, for money? To be with another woman? That's all ridiculous to me. No. No, I will, I will not do that. And so she knows that. She knows there have been testings. She knows that. There have been, we'll be real on this program and say this. There have been women in the church who have gone after me, Marie's aware of. You know, as they'll, they'll go after an ugly toad. You know, you don't have to even be handsome. Why'd you look at me when you said well, that? Well, I wanted to tell you about about Cha Cha who likes you. <laughs> Cha 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 Moreno. She's been writing love stories to you. Oh my! <laughs> but the bottom line is, uh, I I don't know what you live for, John. I can't speak for you, but I know what I live for. I want to hear the well done. Mm. And I never want to lose her love. That's what I live for. And I never want to lose my children's love. 
and my grandbaby's love. And I don't want to lose that. It's that valuable. And so she knows that about me. She knows that about me. And that helps her to trust me. Mm -hmm. I fear God, and I love my wife. Mm -hmm. She knows that. So I would hope that every man could say what I just said. Right. I would hope every woman could look at her husband the way my wife looks at me and admires and respects and and I'm I you know I've said it I've said it in church uh, I say it before my girl here I'm her hero I'm her hero she knows no man greater than me because I have intended to be that man and I've succeeded and I will continue to succeed because she's that important to me I will be that hero to her and and every woman wants a man that she can look up to John yes. and to say that that that's the man that I married and I love him. Mm -hmm. Well, for me that matters a lot. A lot. I, I I don't I really don't care what other people say about me that much. I do appreciate nice things. Who doesn't? But there's only a few people in this world with her as the number one. There's only a few people in this world that that kind of comment matters. I mean, it's all said and done. When I'm laying on that bed and I'm about to go to heaven, my church is not going to be in there with me. All these people that have approached me over time and oh, I love you, Pastor, only to be gone two weeks later. You know, I got a letter from a guy saying, I just love you. I want you to know that. Two weeks later, he's gone in another church. He never even told me. He had just written me how much I love you and you're my pastor. You've been my pastor for years. And, mm -hmm. and then two weeks later, I find out he's somewhere else. And I wrote him and I said, I, you were just telling me how much I, you love me. Could have said goodbye while you were at it, right? See, so I've had a lot of goodbyes. I've had a lot of, oh, you're the best. So I don't even listen to those things. I don't, you know, I appreciate them, but I don't listen to them. Why? Because there's only one person that has stuck with me through everything. From the first minute this church was planted mm -hmm. to the moment we're sitting right here, there's only one, and it's been my girl. You know, so why would I want somebody else's attention and affection? No. So she trusts that. She trusts that. And I'm just saying, she's, I, I can say the same about her. There's no man in the world, that, no man mm -hmm. in the world that she would want mm -hmm. other than me. And That's praise right. God for that. That's yes. what marriage is supposed right. to be. It is. Right. Right, it is. You know, Pastor, you mentioned something, and I'm wondering, even even for some of the guys that are watching here, I know this we're, we're talking about couples, but for the men that are watching, I wonder how many guys are really out there who are thinking that I don't deserve God's love, or, or how can God love me, uh, or who am I really in Christ? Because once that's settled, then there's the trust. Because if some guys can come... They have a, they're, they're suspicious on everything, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, when's the right. carpet going to be pulled out from underneath me? It can't, right. how can he love me? Or, mm -hmm. and so there's that suspicious heart already in addition to I'm not good enough, which are amazing tactics from the enemy to keep us from really receiving Absolutely. God's love. What would you say, what would you, even to the ladies that may be feeling I'm not worthy to be loved or how can God love me so much? Cause you said something interesting, pastor, when that settled, and we can understand that. That's when we trust in the Lord that gives us the ability to have that trust between a husband and a wife. What would you guys say to those, that man or that woman who's really, really, how can God really love me? There was a, um, one of my favorite stories in the New Testament. It's found in Mark 9. It's when Jesus was there in the Mount Transfiguration and and he had come down after that moment up there with Moses and Elijah and his men. And when he came down the hill, the apostles whom had been left behind were in the midst of a commotion because a man had brought his son to them and had asked them to cast a demon out of him. And they had attempted to, but they had failed. And so... The Pharisees and religious leaders were making a great to-do over this failure. And, and, I, and I love this story because 
Jesus first comes and protects his men. What do you, he goes like that. I can almost see him lifting his, his chin like a good Chicano. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Forgive me for those of you who are not of Mexican American ancestry. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, what are you talking to him about? That, that shepherd, that shepherd heart of Jesus to protect his men. So he takes upon himself the, um, the ire, you know. The man walks up and says, I brought my son. I brought my son to your men because the demon takes him and casts him into the water or throws him into the fire. And I brought him so that your men might cast him out. And they, they failed. They couldn't do it. And, and Jesus asks them, bring the, bring the boy to me. And so as he speaks to the man, he says to him, uh, everything's possible to the one who believes. And the man's response, uh, Lord, I believe. But he goes on in the King James, I memorized it many years ago, help thou mine unbelief. Mm -hmm. Lord, I believe. That's not the thing that worries me. It's my unbelief that I have the struggles with. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are things that I know intellectually that are accurate and true. My God doesn't lie. He has said it, therefore it's true. I do believe, but there are elements of my faith that are so weak, so unfounded, so, so in need of help. You know, unbelief sometimes can be a very religious experience. Yes. Religious people are the ones sometimes who struggle with unbelief, you know. And so what happens is, yeah, God so loved the world. I'm part of that world. God loved me. But we, we don't let the seed of the word fall deeply within us. It's kind of on a shallow level where we acknowledge uh, that there is truth to that. My God doesn't lie. But in terms of the experiential knowledge, the depth of understanding, it's not there. That's why as you've been going through, as you went through Ephesians, where Paul prayed that, 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 that God would make it clear to these people that they'd be able to comprehend with all the saints. Why is that? Well, because we deal with unbelief. It's because we hear and we intellectually believe, we say we do, and there's no reason to say that, there, that there's not fact in that we do. But there are levels of, of experiential knowledge that God gives us there's the gnosis, but then there are those who would speak of the epinosis, you know, the deeper personal experiential knowledge beyond the intellectual, but that runs deeper into the soul, that epinosis, the, the experiential knowledge. I, I, I know this scripture says God loves me, and then, but God help my unbelief. I, if, I, if there's anything that... I would, as a pastor, say is very prominent in the church world today, John. It's people quoting scriptures they really haven't understood yet. And you see it in you see it on Facebook and Instagram all the time, where people say, Well, to me it means this. You know, so their experience dictates their understanding. You know, they eisegete, they they read into scripture their own personal understanding and opinions, right? Instead of uh exegeting instead of having it speak plainly its own sense to their hearts right so i really believe that what god would have those who have doubt is he would have them spend some time alone with him right. get on your face in your carpet in your bedroom you know ask the wife uh, could you step out for a while i'm gonna spend time with the lord and you know, stay in that room stay in that room like the old saints used to do uh, until you have your breakthrough until you till you know and you walk out and you say, you know what, my God heard me. And uh, my life is, has been a series of those things where, where I've been brought to the, to the edge of the sea, you know, but the water's not parted, you know. And I've had to hear the words of Moses in a personal level, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Watch what God will do. And then later on, crossing the, uh, the Jordan, you know, your feet will touch the water, it'll part which I find interesting because on, on the one part with the cross in the Red Sea, God caused a, a, a wind to come to part the sea on their behalf. They needed to see he was with them. But when they conquered the land, they needed to step in in faith. And the minute the priest's feet hit that water, it parted before them. They had to take the plunge, if you will. They had to trust him. 
and it opens up. And, and you want to get beyond the standstill. You want to get to the step in, you know, and, and I believe that that comes through prayer and it comes to putting into practice what the Spirit says through his word. And it, it comes to accepting and acknowledging that, that, that these things apply and, they, and, and God does work. You know, a lot of times we hear people say, I believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the power of God Amen. who answers <laughs> prayer, you know, because a lot of people pray. Right. But no, I, I believe in the power of God, the God who answers our prayer. Call unto me, I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I can do things above anything you can ask or think. Well, I don't know how much I ask and I don't know how much I think. But over time, you start finding yourself asking and thinking different things because you've experienced different things, right? And so for me in ministry, it's been a matter of applying what I know to the situation and seeing the Lord true to his word. And then you grow an experience with that. That all comes back to our marriage, to our marriage. You know, there are very few things that you have that are that are deeply, more deeply personal than your marriage. Very few things. Your relationship with God and your prayer life is very personal, but your relationship with your spouse is right behind that. And so the most intimate thing a man does with his wife isn't physical. The most intimate thing he does is pray because your soul is opened up and she sees what your heart really is when you really pray. And those are the things that I think many men have failed to realize. They're, they're reading the word and coming to their wife and Marie and I can, I can tell you this is true. You know, um, I talk to her all the time about what I'm gonna teach or what the Lord has mm -hmm. taught me in the word. And, and that's our conversation not every minute of the day, but a good portion of it. Uh, hey, baby, I want to tell you, you know what I saw? I was reading, and that's kind of what we do. And she does devotion. She'll, she'll walk with a little devotional book, and she'll say, listen to this. You know, and she wants to tell me something she just learned. And that, that's pretty much our life. And so when you combine those, combine those things, uh, it makes what we are. You know, I'm so thankful that God placed me in the ministry because it's a place that, that she, need, she needed a pastor mm -hmm. for a husband, mm -hmm. not just a guy who's going to, and there's nothing wrong with this, God knows this, who's, who's got other work to do, and then comes to church. She needed a guy like me because she's a woman like that. She, she wants, she wants a, a spiritual leader, not, not, not simply a provider or a conversationalist. She wants a spiritual leader someone that she can speak to and say, I, I'm hurt for this, or I'm afraid of that, or I'm concerned about this, and not hear me just say, you know, right now I'm watching the game, we'll talk later on. <laughs> right? She really needs that, right. you know? I believe every marriage, that really is needed, because the husband is the priest of the home. The husband is what I mean when Paul's saying, if you, to the women in 1 Corinthians, if you have a question, he said, Ask your husbands at home. What is that, restricting a woman in church? No. He's saying your husband ought to be your spiritual leader. And, and if you've got a question, he should be equipped to answer it. And, and Marie needed that. Mm -hmm. She needed that. But every Christian woman who loves Jesus needs that too. And husbands, many are failing. Not those who are watching right now because this is an option. They're listening, they don't have to. Maybe mommy made you, <laughs> they don't have to. And why are they listening? They're listening because they wanna be the man of God that God wants them to be. And those are the ones who are watching us and who will watch us because as we've seen hundreds watch us live, but then others will watch over the weekend. And um, these are men right. who want to be God's men and women who want husband who is God's man and who want to be a woman of God. And it all works out in your right. marriage. If, if, you, if you can't live for Jesus in your home, you have no business trying to talk about him in public. You don't, because you're not, you're not pastoring your church. Mm -hmm. You're not ministering 
to the flock. You're not tending and, and mending. You're not doing that. So if you can do that in home, if my wife can listen to me speak in church, it's only because she's able to listen to me speak in the house. That's how that works. Because I could never preach to this congregation knowing my wife knows that I'm really not that guy that is preaching out there. So if a man can teach his wife, he can teach anyone. And that's a real important thing. You know, a while back in our conversation, you said you had 50 employees. Does Around that include there, I don't me? Know. <laughs> well, I have 50 men who work. <laughs> and I've got you, John. <laughs> This is a question for both you. Both of you, how does a couple safeguard trust in a marriage? I don't. I you know again, you know me, and you, you don't mind me bouncing in, right, no, baby? No. no. Okay. Yeah. I'm not a guy who gives you ten ways to do that. Yes. I'm not that guy. Uh, I believe that my my entire um, ministry of safeguarding trust is just being a man who can be trusted and. And that comes from my walk with God. You know, I, I do my, I, I, I pray and I, I do the basic things, you know, I, I, things that Jesus said to do. I, I, I do those things and I pray and, uh, and I, and I um, try to live out what I teach other people. So the sincerity of my heart, I think, is what Marie trusts in. She sees that this is a man who's not perfect, but who is certainly moving in the direction he's supposed to go. And that safeguards her. Mm -hmm. Now, I have been blessed with a woman that I don't have to try to force to read and force to sit down and talk about Jesus. There are homes, I'd say a huge amount, percentage-wise, of homes where that's just not true, where perhaps the husband's not the leader and the, the wife doesn't respect him as a leader anymore or the woman refuses to listen to what the husband says. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had conversations in the past with women um, who quite obviously would be very difficult for me to, to have as, as uh, a wife, simply because they can be, some, some have been so harsh and so demanding and, you know, without judging them, they must have good reasons why they have become like that, and I'm certainly not judging them, because you normally become something because of what went on, and you're responding to it, and 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 I and and so that's no judgment. It's what I'm saying is, is that I I have seen that, and I have thought in, at this moment that this woman, the way she is, would be very very difficult to to lead, to lead, because. She's demanding on her, making demands on her husband that that I wouldn't put up with, mm -hmm. you know. And, and and I think that's part of what Marie and I, are, you know, mm -hmm. she 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 and I have an agreement that mm -hmm. that um, she's not my mother and I'm not her dad, so she's not going to tell me what to do, and I don't tell her what to do. What we do is what is good for us. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean when I say we chose us. And but somebody's got to end up making a decision and take the responsibility for it. And all the way back in the book of Genesis, when Sarah's giggling in her tent because God has just spoken concerning children and all. And and he, God says to Abram, why did why did Sarah laugh? And I always look at that and I realize that Abram was responsible for the wife. God didn't say, Sarah, why are you laughing? He said to Abram, why is she laughing? Because obviously Abram hadn't taught her to trust God. Abram had not really instructed her. And even if this is um, beyond belief, the woman's going to be 90 years old, that isn't laughing matter when God speaks. You, you just trust him, right? And But who did he speak to? He, he, he didn't speak to the woman hiding behind you know, in that tent, he spoke to the husband. And so I saw that a long time ago, and I, I came to realize that uh, I have great responsibilities. And so as a husband, you take them seriously. But the wife also has responsibilities, you know. 
And uh, Sarah, Sarah, the scripture says, Sarah obeyed Abram and called him Lord. You know, that isn't a slave relationship, you know, a demeaning relationship. That's a respect relationship where, where she knew his word was solid and that he was a man of honor. And because of that, she became a princess, you know, because her name means that. From Sarai, which was dominator, she became princess. Mm -hmm. And, and, and mm -hmm. how? How did that happen? Well, her husband did the right thing in honoring God, and she respected him. And her dominating personality, you know, go into my handmaiden and fulfill the promise God made you and created the problem that exists to this day. Um, and he listened to the voice of his wife, you know, instead of trusting the Lord. So they learned together. But at the end, she called him Lord, and she obeyed him. You know, she hearkened to his voice and did that which was necessary. Mm -hmm. Obedience is not simply um, um, doing something. Obedience is a heart that's right. willing to follow mm -hmm. what has been said. So her heart was changed. It wasn't just her physical, I'll do it, but I don't want to. It was more of a, I do that out of the pleasure of my heart to do the right thing. And th that came through their marital relationship and the walk with God. So you can see where obedience then leads to trust, which then leads to the roles that God has called us to be. Yeah, I think you trust and obey, and then you trust even more. Remember that old that's song? Trust and mm -hmm. obey. There's, there's no, no other, other way. way. That's the Lord. You want, you're going to want to obey Him. Right. Right. Because you want a woman who loves the Lord will do the things that she ought to do. She should do the things that, if she really loved the Lord, um, you'll do the things that a woman ought to do for her husband. Yeah, that's true. I, cherish him I'm trying to teach my wife that verse to call me Lord, <laughs> but she still hasn't memorized it yet. <laughs> oh, that's such a long verse, too. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, Marie. It, it, and again, it, the trusting, trusting and obeying is so key for us to, to fulfill the roles that God has called us to be for husband and wife. Because a woman can be so... Um, where are you? What are you doing? <laughs> Who are you with? You know, I've, I've talked to women. What's he doing? Are they, is he out with somebody else? And if you're going to do that to your husband all the time, <laughs> it's not going to work <laughs> very well. <laughs> but you've got to trust God, and you've got to end up, you've got to pray for your husband and show him love rather than um, constantly bringing up things. Mm. Mm. Too. And some of the things of the past that uh, they have, people have dealt, you know, that some things that are past, leave them in the past. For, learn, you have to learn to forgive. That's right. You really yeah. do. The two need to forgive one another for whatever, uh, for, for whatever they've caused uh, uh, problems in the marriage. Um, but there's a humility that needs to be in, in the marriage. Mm -hmm. You know how I can tell when, it, when I'm dealing with a couple? How I can tell where there's no forgiveness mm -hmm. is when they argue that it's mm -hmm. the first thing they bring up oh, yeah. to yes, one another. Yes, exactly. And they're John. thrown out, becomes this tennis match, that exactly. tick for tack. And, and discussing those things, that I can tell you haven't forgiven them for this. Exactly. Or there's a pseudo forgiveness that's involved mm -hmm. that's not really, mm -hmm. and that can really hinder the trust in the, in the relationship within the marriage. If we were to, as we close this segment on trust, if you can complete this sentence, without trust, a marriage will be like yours. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. walked right into that one. <laughs> without love? With... <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> I walked right into that one. You, you did, John. You did. <laughs> Want to try that again? Okay. <clears throat> Let me see how I can reword this. Without trust being a fact, uh, uh, a key component in a marriage, what would the outcome be? Unhappiness, mm -hmm. a lack of joy, mm -hmm. no fulfillment, no love. No love. That's almost like The Walking Dead, then. I mean, if you don't have that in your marriage. That's a key component. 
As a matter of fact, I would have to say it's something that, you know, when you brought up the topic today, because we hadn't spoken and so you hadn't mentioned to me, so I, I haven't been thinking about that element. Um, for us, Marie, Marie and I would not be together at all if we didn't have that at first. That's right. It was already there. I mean, you know, I mean, it's in every small element of relationship. I call Marie, I say we're dating, I call her up. You know, uh, Marie, you have time to visit? Is there somebody there? She's got a guy in the other room, you know, or whatever. And, oh, no, she never did anything like that. You know, there's nobody here. You know, so from the beginning, you know, I, I, I knew she was true to her word. From the beginning, when when I, I said, I'll be there at such and so time, and I'll pick you up, I, I trusted she'd actually be there. I was driving from Norwalk to Ontario. It was a 40, 45-minute drive. I was trusting that she was going to be there because in the past I had girlfriends where I would say, I'm going to come and they're not even there. They're out with their friends or doing something. So, you know, we've all experienced disappointments in relationships and no, this girl was always there. So from the very beginning, you know, she was trustworthy. You know, I, I went to Europe for three months when we were dating and I, I never thought that I would lose her to some other guy. I, I never, never, never felt I could. Had she decided to go out while I was gone, uh, that would have been up to her. I didn't own her. She makes her own choices as to whether or not she wants to be with me and make us an exclusive relationship and all. And one of my friends, Monty, one of my friends, while I was gone, gave her a call, you know, or talked to you at some event. Yes. And said, uh, well, Marie, you know, we ought to go out. You know, one of my ex-friends, you know, <laughs> we ought to go out. Um, I never, I, you know, I never would have in a thousand years thought she would have gone out with my friend Monty on a, and she didn't. You know, she, she did go out with some, some officer, some CHP guy, um, because her roommate encouraged her, oh, you might as well go out and just, which, uh, you know, I was not happy when I heard about that, but um, it was not romantic by any no, means. No, it you know, wasn't she at just all. got out of the house to do something. And, and even so, if she decided to go out with him, who am I to tell her not to, right? I mean, I don't own her, I don't own her heart, you know, and so I came home and she was real quick to let me know, you know, there's a guy, he took, I went bowling and that was it, no romance, nothing at all, you know. And, and, and I thought, well, whatever, you know, because because uh, I trusted her. And, and it was from there, I w we weren't even really that solid yet. Yeah. But from there, you know, I, we went to, I got home from Europe and we went to a, a Kings game, an LA Kings hockey game. Mm -hmm. We went out, I, I was so jet lagged, I fell asleep in a hockey game, <laughs> all the screaming, yelling and fighting. And that was just in the stands. There's even worse <laughs> stuff going out in the ring. But, you know, it was there. I was sitting there. We both actually dozed off. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was at that game, at that game, that I realized that not only did I miss her for the three months that I was gone, but that I didn't want to be away from her ever again. It was at that game. It was that when I finally mm -hmm. said to her, I love you. Mm -hmm. You know, I love you. And I meant it. Because to me, the word love, I love you, this church doesn't know that. I say it to them, and they think it's just something guys say. That's not true. I don't say that. I don't use that word. We were married, and I wouldn't say that to Marie. It's that precious a <laughs> word. You know, so when I tell this church I love this church, they, they just think I'm saying it. They don't know that this is a man who doesn't use that word except when it's real. And so when I was with Marie, and she could tell you that as my oh. girlfriend, as a wife, you know, I didn't say it to her. As a wife, I had to learn to say it to her. I just, I thought, well, what do you need to hear that for? Are you insecure? I would I, tease him. Mm -hmm. And say, tell me you love me. Mm -hmm. How much do you love me? And I'd say, why would I tell you that? <laughs> I would tease him. <laughs> yeah. So you're insecure. Why do you, why do you always ask me that? I mean, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> See, I'm a real matter-of-fact mm -hmm. person. And so all of that goes into... Um, trust is built over time. It's fragile, but it's built over time. 
to the point that where people see our relationship, who know us well, you see it, um, some do. Uh, you say David, you're saying David and Marie. Mm -hmm. You're not just saying David. You say Marie, it's always going to be Marie and David. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because the two became one. Mm -hmm. Because that's how that worked. And so uh, what God has uh, put together, we're not going to destroy. We're not. And it's all built on the love of Christ, the love of God. And part of the element of love is to trust one another. And we do. We do. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. And we trust each other. Yes. And we've been blessed. Good. Amen. Beyond Amen. measure. And even in the, even in the days where um, there wasn't a lot of, we didn't have furniture, our, or our furniture was from somebody who had given to us or we paid $5 for or whatever. Those were the sweetest times, one of the sweetest times. Um, and God, uh, we never went without. He was always faithful. Mm, always God was faithful. always faithful. And even when David talks about the, the bed that was uh, the, our, our first bed. Yeah, the, roll out. Roll out. I, there was no complaint. Never you know, complained. we never complained. I mean, those are, you look back and you think, thank you, God. Thank you. I, thank you. So. She never, she, Marie has never made me feel I can't provide. Has never. Has never made me feel less of a man because I couldn't give her a vacation or take her for a dinner or buy her some clothes. She's never made me feel that, John. I've, I've never felt like, like a failure in that. I've, I've wanted to do more for her. I've, I have personally felt that on my own, I have personally felt that I, I am a failure. I have felt that, but she's never made me feel that. She, Marie, Marie told me something when we were dating, because I told her I'm coming home from Europe, and Marie, I don't have any money. I'm, we can't go out on dates, and we don't, I don't, I, I spend it and I have to go back to school. We're, we're not going to be going anywhere. She said to me, I don't care. She says, as long as it's just you and me together, it's all I want. She's been that way since before we got married. So I've never felt this pressure to be something I'm not, to do for her or else I'll lose. I don't have any of that because uh, what we have, John, and not everybody has that, is we have each other. Mm -hmm. and, and really, I, I say this all the time, Pe mm -hmm. people eventually will believe it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, where she is, I'm home. That's where right. she is, I'm happy. That's, that's a fact, wherever it may be, whether it's in our little home that we had in Ontario mm -hmm. or later on when we moved into a home that was larger. I was always home, regardless if it was this 900 square foot home or where I live now. You know, right. it's because home is her. Mm. Home is her. And wherever she is, I'm content. And, and she's never demanded anything from anything from me, anything um, to make me feel that I should give her this thing so she is happy. Right. What she wanted was me. Yeah, and that's the thing that I don't get. You know? <laughs> Seriously, that's the thing I don't get. But that's what she wants. You know, and I do. That's the love of God, because what He wants is me too. And that's what makes your heart safely trust in Him. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. And vice versa, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah. Well, you guys, thank you so much and speaking on the topic of trust. And you guys gave us some very practical insight and uh, in ways that not only do we continue to trust each other, but to trust in the Lord. Mm. Thank you, guys. Of course.